Welcome to your point of contact for the kingdom of God. I am Pastor Dumas A. Harshaw, Jr., coming to you from First Baptist Church, where we are located at 101 South Wilmington Street in the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, where we stand on the word, we believe in the presence and the power of God's rule and kingdom. It's recorded in the Old Testament, but really reaches another level of fulfillment in the New Testament. And Jesus said to his disciples, the kingdom is within you, reflecting the faith, and particularly our faith in Christ as Lord and Savior. And so we welcome you to kingdom living and kingdom values and kingdom ethics and kingdom truth as we continue to stand on the word of God and declare that our journey uh, says to us by God's spirit and word, it is harvest time. The harvest is plentiful, but the labor is a few. And Jesus said to his disciples, pray to the Lord that God might send more workers in the harvest and in the vineyard. And that's our prayer, and I pray that you're one of those workers, working for good, working by faith, working for righteousness and justice. Uh, come with me to the fourth chapter of the Revelation as we uh, moving toward uh, closing out uh, this chapter, but also talking about worship. And we're gonna, as we close it out, just uh, we see these images of worship, and we want to just uh, make some application to worship that might enhance our understanding of worship and uh, our participation in worship. So I'm going to read from the fourth chapter of Revelation uh, from the verse... Um, that lifts up this uh, powerful image. And uh, we see in verse 6 in particular, it says, Also before the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never Stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory to God, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts and to our minds, and let us apply the word. Shall we pray? Dear eternal God, our heavenly Father, we thank you for this word on worship. We thank you for this image of, of the throne, and around the throne where your name is lifted high, and you are celebrated, adored, and worshiped in such a phenomenal way. Bless your word to our hearts. Speak to our needs is our prayer. Make it plain that we might understand and especially understand how we can apply what we learn to our lives and in the midst of the world in which we live. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. And God's people said, Amen. So excited about this, this fourth chapter, and particularly as it raises for us the whole, the whole notion of, of, of worship. And so again, just a little review, and I like the way the life application commentary really unfolds this section of scripture. I'd like to share some of that uh, with us as we talk together today. 
But we see here John, and again, John was in the spirit, and he saw in heaven uh, someone sitting on a throne. And then he sees all of this beauty and wonderment all around. He saw that throne in heaven. And he saw God in absolute authority and absolute power. And we understand that uh, in the environment, in the empire, the emperors and the Caesars were people who were adored and worshipped in so many ways. And so here the contrast is that there's only one who deserves worship, and that is the living God, the Lord God Almighty. And um, the commentary says, uh, praise the Lord in this portion uh, of God's word. It says, John describes the majestic throne room of God and all those who were praising God there. Praise is saying thank you to God for each aspect of God's divine nature. Our inward attitude becomes outward expression. Let me read that again. Our inward attitude becomes outward expression. When we praise God, we help ourselves by expanding our awareness of who God is. As you read Revelation, look for names and attributes of, or characteristics of God for which you can then praise God. And we're called to give God's name glory and praise. And we see these 24 thrones and 24 elders sitting on them. And, and uh, what is interesting is that they are continuing without stop giving praise to God. And it's kind of comical, people who uh, don't like uh, worship service. And they say, well, I'm going to heaven to be with the Lord. But it sounds like there's going to be a lot of worship there. <laughs> and so that may not be the place you want to go because it's um, eternally giving God adoration and worship and reverence, glorifying God and praising God for who God is and what God has done. And, and, and so we see here uh, this picture of God's creatures and who God has made giving God praise over and above anything that the world can do. And so we have already seen that here God is eternal and God is infinite. God is immeasurable. God is incomprehensible, omnipresent, omnipotent, invisible. And so when we look at these 24 elders, it, it's hard to understand exactly who they might be. And there's some scenarios uh, that scholars have tried to come up with as special possibilities. And, and, and one is that because there were 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and 12 apostles in the New Testament, that the 24 elders uh, in this vision then represent all the redeemed of God for all time, uh, both before and after Christ's death and, and resurrection. And so they, they symbolize all those, both Jews and Gentiles, who are now part of God's family. Uh, the 24 elders show us that all, A-L-L, -L, all the redeemed of the Lord are worshiping the Lord. And then there's a possibility that 24 elders are the heavenly counterpart of the 24 priestly ranks who served the temple, according to 1 Chronicles, the 23rd chapter and verse 6, and the 24th chapter, verses 7 through 18. And then another possibility, and this commentator says this is probably what is most uh, likely, that the elders are an angelic group providing this worship experience. And the reference to the 24 remains... Uh, uh, question. Someone um, would question because we don't know exactly what it means. But what we do see is that there's continual praise and it supports this view and the fact that they serve um, uh, with but are distinguished from the four living creatures uh, that are highlighted in chapter 4 verse 11, chapter 5 verses 9 through 10, chapter 11 verses 7 through 18 chapter 19 verse 4 
And so that the 24 elders are beings who live in heaven and worship God at God's throne. And though they are crowned and dressed in white, they clearly do not represent the church. And these leaders sing of human believers, uh, not about themselves in view of their actions, such as worshiping and offering bowls of incense. They seem to be a special order of angels. Well, you can pick and choose what may sound more reasonable to you or possibility to you. They are fascinating to, uh, to consider each one of these. And I think the key that we learn from all of this, though, is that the focus is upon worshiping God and his sovereignty and his holiness and his righteousness um, and to be in the throne room, to be around the throne of God, that all creation, all creatures, however God has made them, are there in order to lift up God's name and being and essence. And how exciting that really is. And then with it, in the fifth verse, we see the lightning and the thunder uh, really uh, reminding us of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19.16 and the majesty of God in Psalm 77.18 and God's throne being lifted up and all the coming events of what that represents and what that means. You have uh, the seven seals and you have the seventh trumpet and the seventh bowl and the seventh lamp and and uh, and believing that the seven lamps represent the Holy Spirit and we see the contrast also in the reference in Ezekiel um, the first chapter in verse 13 Zechariah 4 2 and and the seven spirits of God uh, also referencing and lifting up the name of, of the Holy Spirit. And, and and just look at the picture that we read in the sixth verse that, that is so beautiful. Uh, the scripture, we've seen the colors and the precious gems and stones uh, that are part of this view. And then the glass, uh, this notion of glass that was clear as crystal, now, something that was very rare in New Testament times and almost impossible to find. And yet here in the throne of God is a sea of glass right there. What a magnificent floor of God's throne room and, and the reflection on God's holiness in so many ways. And you can uh, see also Job chapter 37 and verse 18. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 22 reminding us of, of, of this and then in the center right in the center around the throne were were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes the word says in front and in back and 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 it looked like these are angelic beings of a higher order and the same ones we saw reflected in Isaiah the sixth chapter unusual and the eyes then um, uh, then call us to think about the notion of deep knowledge and deep truth but also alertness in terms of what is taking place and focus on what is uh, pri priority and primary and that is giving God praise and worshiping the Lord and we get caught up in so many things and our understanding of playing out church and being involved in organized religion and organized Christianity and Christian institutions that often we forget the primary, the priority, and that is worshiping God. And it's all about giving God glory, giving God praise, and not just verbally and not just in music and lyrics and not just by sounds that we make, but rather in terms of surrender and dedication and openness to the will and the way of God. That's part of worship. Worship is a lifestyle. It's not an hour of gathering somewhere. It's, it's not going someplace to gather only. But it's really something that we can do every single day of our lives and we ought to be doing. You know, you wake up, you can worship God and you go through the day and you worship God and then you can gather with other believers and worship God. But, but it really is a lifestyle of, of putting God first and lifting up the name of God, but also being receptive to God's will and God's word and uh, the belief that God knows better 
than you or me how to live your life with fulfillment and purpose and uh, how to embrace the life which is abundant according to Jesus Christ. And I like the way uh, this author says it, worship, and John describes these scenes in such detail because Christians in the first century came from many backgrounds. Not all of them understood Jewish history. Uh, not all of them understood the glory of the temple. And, and so the book of Revelation is a, a guidebook, and particularly this fourth chapter also, in, in chapter 5, on, on how to worship and how to put God first. And it shows us where to worship and why to worship and how to worship in the sense of praising God. And can you just imagine that, all of creation just praising the Lord, that all the created order, but every human being giving God praise and worship. And you get a sense of that when you hear people sing in unison and, and in unity, a choir singing or believers singing, a whole congregation singing hymns or singing spiritual songs and lifting up their voices in praise. There's nothing like it. And, and, and it does so much for your soul and it does so much uh, for your inspirational needs uh, to, to just hear um, God being praised and hear the songs of Zion. There's something so beautiful about that. Thank God for the music ministry and thank God for musicians and thank God for vocalists and thank God for choirs and praise teams and artists who are part of uh, the body of Christ who are praising God and they, uh, they, they get us through so much just to hear a song that speaks to your need and, and is giving God first place in all the proceedings and all that is going on. And, and, and there's something special about that. And then, and then worship takes our, our minds off of our problems and helps us to focus them on the Lord and what the Lord can do about them. And so worship leads us from uh, individual meditation uh, to corporate or group worship. And so you can worship God every day on your own, but there's nothing like being part of the <laughs> assembly of faith and, and a worship experience, a corporate gathering, and in, and in person where people are just praising God. It just does something. It lifts you uh, in a powerful way, and it causes us to consider and appreciate God's character and God's love and God's mercy and then understand the, the, the power of God's word and to feel the presence of God's Holy Spirit. And, and so it helps us to, to have another perspective uh, to be able to look uh, beyond the natural realm or the, beyond the world or the secular world in which we live and, and to see a picture of heaven, uh, God's rule and God's uh, authority and God's sovereign power and the place that God has prepared for us but, but it, 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 it's such a beautiful a beautiful picture and, and so we see in the seventh verse here that the, the first living creature was like a lion the second one was like an ox the third had a face uh, like a man the fourth was like a flying eagle and we have similarities in the prophecy of Ezekiel Again, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, and uh, chapter 10 and verse 14. How, and, and we see a glimpse of that. But however, when we get here to John's vision, um, uh, each creature has only one face, uh, one face. In Ezekiel's uh, vision, uh, God calls Ezekiel to be a prophet. And God showed Ezekiel that there was coming destruction to uh, Jerusalem uh, because God was punishing Judah for their rebellious ways and their sinful ways and so Ezekiel stood in the power of the prophetic word and prophesied during this time when the Babylonians uh, sacked Jerusalem and took over Jerusalem now now when we see it in John's vision um, the living beings uh, show uh, John, the final destruction of, of the world and punishment for sin that is coming and, 
and then the appearance of these creatures then represent and symbolize uh, the highest expression uh, of God's attributes, uh, the animal-like appearance of these four creatures include majesty and power, the lion, and faithfulness, the ox, intelligence, the human being, and sovereignty, the eagle. And then in verse 8 it says each of the, the living, the four living creatures, uh, they had six wings and was covered with eyes all around even under the wings and day and night they they never stop saying holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come <laughs> what a beautiful picture uh that represents power and movement uh, and again we remember what we saw in isaiah's prophecy in the sixth chapter and to see these eyes all around just seems to suggest complete knowledge and, and a deeper kind of perception uh, beyond human uh, perce uh, perception. And then day and night, uh, without end, they never stop giving praise to God. What would our lives look like if we, in one form or another, we know we got to go to school, we got to work, we got to clean the house, we have to raise families. Uh, we have to go out in the yard. We have to go shopping. There's so many things that we have to do. But but that doesn't prevent us from learning how, in the midst of all of that, to pray and have a spirit of prayer, uh, but also to worship God. And just simple things. You're on your way somewhere and you hear a bird sing. And you can just say, praise the Lord. Uh, you know, you go outside and you feel the breeze of a strong wind or you see the beauty of the sunshine or you see new buds some flowers you planted uh, and the list goes on and on and all of these are invitations for us to praise God and to thank God you see the beauty of human faces and and uh, the beauty of human connections and relationships you say thank God praise the Lord for uh, for people for creating all these wonderful human beings and so these four living creatures and are singing about God's holiness, uh, singing about God's authority. And again, the three times uh, must have meaning, holy, 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 as if to say uh, God is holy, God is holy, God is holy, like ultimate, complete holiness uh, is a picture that we, we get, that God is the ultimate divine warrior, that the Lord God Almighty is able to do all things and so no matter what happens on earth or no matter what we go through or no matter what is happening in history or in society now we know that God is in charge and that God is almighty and we can't figure out all the details of it but that's what we declare that victory is in the hands of almighty God God is to be praised all created creatures are praising God and then the phrase uh, in this portion is, who was and is and is to come, the Almighty. Well, what a beautiful description of God. We talk about transcendence and how great God is above everything, even above time, and how God stands. And then we are invited to know God through Christ, that we can know this God who is so awesome, we can know this God through the blood of the Lamb, through the reality of the cross, through the power of the resurrection, through the preach and taught gospel, uh, that, that we can know God. There's nothing like knowing God. Someone said, God cannot be known apart from God's holiness. The key to God's eternal reign is God's holiness. His glory is not only his strength, but also his perfect moral character. God will never do anything that is not perfect. And this uh, reassures us that we can fully trust God, yet it places a demand on us at the same time that we need to be drawn into that holiness, drawn into that wonderful life and character. And so our desire, the closer we get to God, is to be made holy, um, to be dedicated to God in our ways, to be dedicated to truth the God's truth in our ways 
and then also to be moral characters and to grow in maturity in terms of decisions we make and and how we act and how we treat people, how we treat the created order around us, how we treat one another and other human beings. And, uh, and it's the only suitable response for God's holiness is surrender and saying yes. And that way we're prepared for when Christ comes again. If there's any judgment on the world, we don't have to live in fear because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Because he, God has made a way for us. And so therefore we can conquer sin because it's conquered by the cross and the blood of the Lamb. And we can get better. We can grow. And, um, and then God places within our spirit that desire to be close to God. <clears throat> and in being in close to, uh, connection with God means a, a life of holiness. And not, not so much in the denominational holiness and how people make that up, but, but in terms of the sheer presence of God, the sheer glory of God, the sheer character of God, and, and that comes with uh, moral stability, it comes with an ethical lifestyle, and we're on our way. And someone said, I can thank God that, uh, that I'm not what I, I used to be, uh, that God is working in me, Thank the Lord. I'm not all that I need to be, but I'm not what I used to be. And, and what a testimony that is. And then we see these 24 elders falling down and being a model for us and, uh, and then worshiping the one sitting on the throne. There's only one that can inhabit that throne. And it's not us. And it's not any emperor. It's not any Caesar. It's not any dictator. It's not any political leader. But rather, it's the Lord God Almighty. It's the risen Christ and all of his power. It's the victorious Jesus and all that he has accomplished for us. And then it, it says in this picture that it's a complete uh, picture of worship and submission to God's will and God's purpose. And then it says the one who lives forever and ever. What a promise. The one who is truly worthy. And that's what it says. The one who is truly worthy of worship more than any other entity in all creation. And you can see in Psalm 45, 6 and Psalm 102, 27, a reference here. And this throne symbolizes power and authority and the living beings and all the created, they're all gathered to give God praise. The 24 elders fall down and worship the Lord. And, and, and that's a reference to a uh, 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 lying down prostate in a position of submission and adoration. And we see that reflected in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, in the presence of the Lord. And then sometimes it's being like some have noted, being slain in the spirit. But there are times when God will have you prostrate. God will have you fall on your face and give him glory, fall on your knees and call on his name. Uh, or else God would then push you backwards in a sense and you will be on your back giving his name praise and glory. And sometimes in the very presence of God, we cannot stand in our natural strength, uh, but we must surrender. And just like when they came to get Jesus, um, one of the gospels is captured and, and Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they say, well, we're looking for you, for the one <laughs> Uh, who has uh, said that he is the Messiah in the way of speaking. And then Jesus says, well, I am he. And then they fall backwards. And then they, they get up. And then they, and he said, well, who are you looking for? And the same thing happens again. And sometimes the very presence of God can put us on our back. Or else God can just move upon your spirit that you just want to fall, lay out on the floor and give his name praise and glory. And utter your prayers to the Lord or simply worship God for who God is. And it, it's a way to submit to the will of God. It's an act of adoration. It's a way to worship, which, which means giving glory to God, giving honor to God, and living in gratitude for what God has done for us. And then that last verse, and they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy. O oh Lord our God, to receive glory and honor 
and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased and so this is a, like a, a hymn that is being sung uh, uh, to the Lord. There is no king. There is no leader. There is no emperor. There is no Caesar. There is no Roman power at all that belongs in this category of worship. And sometimes when the, when the emperors would come, they would sing hymns of glory to those emperors. But nothing in comparison like what we see in this fourth chapter of the book of, of Revelation. You are worthy. And so the, the Caesar, the emperors will come and they say, you are worthy. And then one uh, decided that then he would add the phrase, our Lord and God, so that he started this cult worship uh, of the people. So they would literally worship him. His power went to his head. And he thought that he was worthy of worship because of all the power that he had been given by the Roman Empire about whatever way. That there's no power that can stand against the power of Almighty God. And all those leaders will come and go. All those emperors came and they died. But the Lord we serve is a living Christ. And he lives forever. And so then they lay their crowns before his throne. In other words, all authority, all power, all majesty, all worship belongs to the God who made us, the Christ who died for us, and the Holy Spirit who empowers us. Amen? Amen indeed. And we have learned that, that for worship to be what it needs to be, it needs to be biblical. And we will revisit that notion. And then it needs to be relational so let us stop for there for now and um, come back so we can learn some more pray for us lift us up in prayer and read the word on your own uh, so you can get an understanding let us pray dear lord we thank you for the privilege of worship we thank you for the ability to praise your glorious name we thank you for all that you have done for us, with us, and even through us. And we declare, if it had not been for the Lord on our side, where in the world would we be today? Lord, bless us with a hunger for your word. Help us to surrender to your will. And teach us, teach us, teach us how to worship. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you.